Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, open up to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. That's page 977 in the Pew Bible. If you don't have your own copy of God's Word, feel free to open up there. Paul writes under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit in such a way that as the words on this page are being read, God Himself is speaking to us. Beginning in verse 1. I, therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord. One faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions of the earth? He who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Verse 11, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature Manhood to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, rather speaking the truth in love. We are to grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ from whom the whole body, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Let's pray. Oh God, please open our hearts and minds today to be changed by your word. God, I pray we would receive it and indeed grow up in every way by the power of your Spirit, through your Word today. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Um, Every now and again, I will kind of get sucked into a rabbit hole, uh, going back in time in pictures, in particular pictures of my family, pictures of my children. I am, I don't know if you know this, I'm a nostalgic person. I'm kind of sentimental in a lot of ways and nostalgic in a lot of ways, and so... Um, I find myself kind of sucked in sometimes to uh, looking at pictures of our kids when they were little or watching old videos of them saying funny things or doing funny things. In fact, m- more often than not, I've got this little app on my phone called Time Hop. And what Time Hop does is it kind of shows you from social media and your camera roll and everything else, it shows you pictures from today over however many years back it goes. And so uh, more often than not, Time Hop ruins my morning. Because I'll look and I'll see a picture of my kids when they're little and I'll get sad. And I'll think, oh man, I, I miss them being little. And then I remember changing diapers. And I'm like, okay, it's not so bad, all right? It could be worse. But every time I get sad about my kids growing up or sentimental about where they were, this is one of those weeks for, for me, a really nostalgic and sentimental week. Uh, Twelve years ago tomorrow, I became the pastor here and so... Watsy uh, came with us. Our daughter, our oldest, was the only child we brought here to Gadsden with us. She was six months old, so just a tiny baby, so I remember those days really well. And then uh, 11 years ago tomorrow, our middle child, Ford, was born. And so this year, I'll have two kids in middle school and only one left in elementary school. And I think about the past a lot around this time of year. And so I can find myself getting a little sad even. And I get sad about thinking about my kids growing up. Um, two kids in middle school, you know, I, all of a sudden I think I'm there. I think I'm an adult. Um, 
I'm going to have two middle schoolers, an elementary school. I've got a mortgage, and I'm the pastor at First Baptist Church. I think it's time to grow up. And uh, uh, I, I think about this. But then I have to remember when I get sad. I get sad about my kids growing up. get sad about how much they've changed. I have to remember this. I remind myself of this almost every day. Matt, that's what they're supposed to do. That's what God designed them to do. In fact, it would be even sadder if they didn't grow up. It would be even sadder if they weren't thriving, if they weren't growing in their academics, if they weren't growing socially, if they weren't growing spiritually, if they, they weren't growing physically. It would be even sadder seeing that happen. We want them to thrive, to get jobs, to start families, to meaningfully contribute to society, to be great churchmen and women one day. We, we want to see that happen. We want to see that. By their very nature, children are designed to grow. And as Christians, this is what we have to remember about discipleship. About what it means to grow up into Christ. It's what we're supposed to do. When you become a Christian, when you receive the Holy Spirit, when Jesus saves you, it is not merely insurance for the afterlife. It is a means by which we grow up in every way into Jesus. This is what it means. A call to Christ is a call to discipleship, a call to follow Jesus. Discipleship is the means by which we grow up into Christ. Disciples follow Jesus, simply put. Disciples are those who follow Jesus. And when we follow Jesus, we grow into Christian maturity. So a short definition of discipleship then is this. I've already said, it's the means by which we grow up into Christ. In following Jesus, we grow up into him and we grow in our Christ-likeness. And every Christian has received a call of discipleship. In fact, uh, The Call of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer is a book that changed my life. I bought it right here in downtown Gadsden when I was a freshman in college at Sneed State Community College, back home in Boaz, and come up here and, and buy books sometimes at the Christian bookstore downtown. And I love it now because I've become friends with uh, Bart Watts, who owned that bookstore. He's a pastor here in town. And I got to tell him one time about how he, he, he talked about how he had a section in the bookstore that he kept there despite the fact it lost money. And he said he just hoped that people would buy books there uh, and maybe it would help change their lives. And one day we were in a pastor's meeting. I got to say, Bart, I bought books from that section. And so thank you so much for having it there because the books I bought there in that section changed my life as a young college student. Here's the reality. The call to Christ is a call to discipleship. It's the cost of discipleship by Bonhoeffer. This morning, I want to show you three points about the task of Christian disciples. What it is that we're called to. I want to show you three points from this text today. What a beautiful passage it is. Three points this morning to help each of us continue to grow as faithful disciples. What will it look like for us to follow Jesus, not just as individuals, but as a church, we'll look for us to have a culture of discipleship. Three points to those ends this morning. Here's the first. Faithful disciples promote gospel culture. Faithful disciples promote gospel culture. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about what I've kind of called gospel culture. Now, now we're kind of transferring over now in the last two Sundays of this series, to what we're going to talk about as gospel impact, what, how we're going to impact the world around us. But discipleship is an important part of gospel impact. It's what we're called to do here as a church. The Great Commission is a call to go make disciples. It's so important. And so I want you to see these first few verses of what Paul says here. It's a sermon on discipleship, but what I'm saying is faithful disciples promote gospel culture. And I think you'll see it here in this passage. Look at verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Now it's interesting, this is just a brief aside. Um, you notice what Paul's talking about while he's in prison? I therefore a prisoner of the Lord, er, for the Lord, urge you to do what? To fight back against the darkness, right? So that apostles don't get put in jail. I told you this was coming, and, and you knew, and you guys have done that. No, that's not what he says, right? 
What does Paul say as Christians are being thrown in jail? We, we talk a lot about how our culture is going crazy and all this kind of stuff and all that we need to do. When Paul's thrown in jail by a very dark pagan culture, what does he write about? He writes about walking worthy of the calling to which you've been called. Christian discipleship is the answer to the great problems of the age in every age and in every context. Even if we start getting thrown in jail, the best thing we can speak of is walking with Jesus. Best thing we can do is walk with Jesus. All that being said, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. And here's how he describes it. With all humility and gentleness... With patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. What's Paul describing here? What does it mean to walk worthy of the calling to which we have been called? What does it mean to walk as faithful disciples of Jesus Christ? Well, basically, Paul's describing here fruits of the Spirit that amount to what we have been calling a gospel culture over the past several weeks. It's a call to fruitfulness, and it's sandwiched between a reminder and a declaration. Walk worthy of the calling to which you have been called, Paul says. And then he says, with humility, gentleness, patience, with love, with unity, in the spirit, in the bond of peace. The reminder is verse 1. Walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Paul is reminding us of when we were called. We were called by the gospel, were we not? When you responded to Jesus for the first time, was it not because you heard the message of grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ? You heard that and and learned that you were a sinner in need of a Savior and that Jesus Christ had provided the most precious remedy there could be for sin, the only remedy there could be for sin in dying for your sins on the cross and becoming your replacement there, to walk, worthy, to walk worthy of the calling to which you've been called. But then he sums this up with a declaration. In the middle, he's telling us how we ought to walk. But remember, it's rooted in God's grace in the gospel. The calling to which you've been called is a calling out of sin and into God's grace to walk with Jesus. And you are there empowered by the Holy Spirit. You're not expected to do this on your own. But then Paul declares something in verses 4 through 6. You see what he says? There is one body and one spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. One God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. Look at it this way. Churches with a healthy gospel culture must be made up of faithful disciples who are centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. The reminder and the declaration are both soaked with the gospel. Paul's reminding us all that it's the basics that are going to allow us to walk with Jesus. Sometimes folks might get confused. I think sometimes people visit here for the first time. They've had a friend or someone say, you're going to love First Baptist Church. Come to First Baptist. Come come see what's going on there. God's, God's working and moving in our church. And they get here and they're sort of like, really? I thought there'd be more going on. I thought, there, I thought you'd be trying more things, doing more things. But folks, I, I'm not saying, listen, we're, we stay busy. There's, there's lots going on. But our commitment, first and foremost, is to see God move by His gospel. And so we don't feel this need to gild the lily all the time, to come up with the newest and greatest, all these different kinds of things. In other words, we want to make sure that it's the gospel that it's front and center here, and it's the gospel that's at work, and it's the gospel that's moving. It's what the Bible says. Basic Christian discipleship is our primary task, and this is what we're trying to do, and God will do the greatest and most amazing things through the simplest means. It's how God works. It's what God does. We don't have to reinvent the wheel. We don't have to come up with some great marketing strategy. We don't have to come up with some crazy thing to do. We just get here, we preach His Word, we go out, we live the gospel, we have a gospel culture here, we live as faithful disciples, and it's God who provides the growth. God does it, not us. Churches with a healthy gospel culture must be made up of faithful disciples who are centered on the gospel of Jesus Christ. If we'll remember what Jesus has called us to, if we'll remember what we're a part of, we we'll remember what we're a part of. We're one body. There's one spirit. We're called to one hope. 
There's one Lord. There's one faith. There's one baptism. There's one God and Father of all who is over all and through all and in all. If we'll remember that, if we'll remember that calling to which we've been called, then we will see ourselves growing in gospel culture as faithful disciples. Faithful disciples promote gospel culture. Second of all, faithful disciples serve with God's gifts. Faithful disciples serve with God's gifts. A a, a culture of discipleship, let me say it like this. A culture of discipleship is focused on using the gifts of God for His glory. Now, some of you might be sitting here this morning saying, thank goodness, I I was waiting on him to get to a point about gifts because I'm pretty convinced I don't have any, right? I don't don't know what my spiritual gifts are. I I I can't think of one thing I can do for the kingdom of God. So I'm just going to enjoy not doing anything. Now, if there are any of you here, let me just say, I I don't know who you are. It's It's such a faithfully serving church. But I do want you to notice something, if that's you. If you've ever wondered whether or not God's really gifted you, I want you to notice what the Bible says. Grace, verse 7, was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, grace has been given to each of us to cover our sins, to forgive us, but in this context, according to the measure of Christ's gift and the following verses, this is clearly not just a reference to our salvation, but also to the calling that God's given us to serve in the local church. You see the way Paul then backs this up biblically. He, he quotes Scripture. Therefore it says, When he ascended on high, he led a host of captives, and he gave gifts to men. Here, here Paul's showing the way this is a reference to the gospel. In these verses that proceed from there, he says, In saying he ascended, what does it mean? But that he also descended. What's Paul saying there? He's saying... This is a reference to what Christ did for us in his gospel. He died, he descended, and he rose again, he ascended. And in doing so, he led a host of captives. And what did he do? He gave gifts to men. And now Jesus is ascended and he has given those gifts to his church. But Paul goes on to describe the sorts of gifts that God gave. He gave apostles and prophets these are those who wrote the scriptures for us in the Old Testament prophets and the New Testament apostles and at certain ages in the church, in the early ages of the church, God raised up both apostles and prophets to serve his church in a unique way in the early days of the church. And those gifts, as we understand them in the New Testament, um, these authoritative apostles and authoritative prophets, th- th- these are no longer gifts, I-, I believe, that God is continuing to give to the church, even though those enterprising aspects of apostolic ministry God still does through pastors and others and certainly the the forth telling of the word of God the proclamation of the word of God that sense of prophetic ministry continues in the Lord's church today but capital A apostles capital P prophets people for whom that is their vocation and calling in life were unique to the church age and the age of the Old Testament but God gave them to us and he and he inscripturated what they had to offer through the Bible. But then he also says he gave us evangelists. He gave us shepherds. That's another word for pastors. He gave teachers. And notice what the Bible says all of these things are here to do. Apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers. He gave us these to equip the saints for the work of ministry. Equip the saints for the work of ministry. Perhaps sometimes you look at our ministerial staff and you think, now that, that's the A team. I mean, those are the ones God's really using. F- friends, let me tell you what God's called us to do. God's called us not to be the A team, but simply to be the ones who equip you. And not through our own gifts and skills necessarily, but gifts of God through the scriptures, right? Right? He's called us to help equip you to do the work of ministry. Let let me put it like this. We will not have a culture of discipleship unless we have a group, a church full of faithful disciples who have a desire to serve with God's gifts. If we leave it to our ministerial staff, 
to do the work of the ministry, what God has called us to do will never be achieved. Because God hasn't simply called us to do that. God has called our whole church body. All of our lives belong to Jesus. We're here to help equip you to do the work of ministry. Now, that's not to say that we don't work hard. That's not to say that there's not some aspects of ministry that we have to do. But if we're going to be who God has called us to be, then all of us must be working together as God has gifted us. As God has gifted us to serve the body and to serve our community. I want to ask you this question. Have you considered how God has gifted you to build up the body of Christ? This is what the Bible says. That he equipped the saints for the work of ministry for building up the body of Christ. Now, some of you may say, hey, pastor, can you send me a spiritual gifts inventory or or something like that. And look, I'm, I'm not anti-spiritual gifts inventory. But sometimes I think when we read the spiritual gifts lists in the Bible, we start to get a little bit of a false assumption. We, we start to think that all the spiritual gifts that could ever exist are listed there in the pages of the Bible. And therefore, if one of those doesn't clearly fit me, that probably means I don't have spiritual gifts. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. A couple things I'll say. I don't believe any of the lists of spiritual gifts in the Bible are exhaustive. In fact, there are lists that have some and then other lists that have others. I think Paul is highlighting certain gifts for the sake of who he's writing to in the context in which he's writing. Now, I do believe all the gifts Paul mentions are spiritual gifts. Don't, don't get me wrong. But I think there are other ways God gifts his people to serve his church. There, there, there's no gift of music listed in any of those lists are there but don't don't we receive tremendous blessings here in our church all the time by people who are gifted in music and you might say right but that's a natural gift what is a natural gift anyway are there such things as natural gifts i mean do we really believe nature gives gifts no we don't believe nature gives gifts who gives gifts choir god gives gifts right God gives gifts. He, he gives it to some of us at, at birth. To others, he gives spiritual gifts later. But taking what God has gifted you to do. You see in the list, of the, uh, the list of the Bible, do you see the gift of finance there? No, you don't. But wouldn't our church be in a mess if it weren't for those people that are so gifted financially, who are able to serve the Lord through our finance committee and in other ways? There's all kinds of ways that God's people serve his church. There's all, all kinds of ways that God's people serve his church. Let me give you a simple definition for determining your spiritual gifts. It's not a, it's not a survey. So it, and, and I would understand it might frustrate some of you. You might want something more, more complicated. And I, I get it. Again, I'm not anti-survey. Your gifts plus the church's needs plus God's work in your life equals spiritual gifts. Your gifts, whether they be gifts you had at birth, gifts you've honed over the years, or gifts that you feel like you've just really focused in on since you've been a Christian, plus the church's needs, plus God's work in your life, equals your spiritual gifts. What God is gifting you to do in the life of the local church. Think about Paul. I want you to think about Paul, the Apostle Paul, who wrote this book for just a moment. What was Paul doing before he was a Christian? He was learning the Bible, teaching the Bible, and he was traveling around from city to city, organizing people. Now, he was organizing people to find and persecute Christians, right? What was Paul doing? He was traveling around from city to city, spreading a message and organizing groups in order to spread and fulfill that message. And then Paul, on the road to Damascus, the scale, the, God blinds him, and then the scales fall on his head. He sees the glory of Christ. He becomes radically saved. And then what does Paul's ministry look like from that point forward? Traveling around from city to city, teaching the scriptures, and organizing people to spread that message. You see? God took Paul's natural gifts, transformed them by the gospel, and took Paul's gifts, put the church's need, plus the work of God in his life, and produce amazing spiritual fruit through him. Friends, faithful disciples promote gospel culture, and they also serve with God's gifts. How has God gifted you to serve in the local church? I want to remind you, 
Not, not every important part of service. This is all throughout the New Testament. Not every important part of service involves a platform. Not every important part of service involves being seen. In fact, I believe with all my heart that it's so often the unseen things that are so much more important. There are little children in this church who would barely know my face, but if they see a nursery worker at Publix, they light up with joy. Just because everyone can't see it doesn't mean it's not important. God's at work in all sorts of ways. Faithful disciples serve with God's gifts. But finally, not only do faithful disciples promote gospel culture, not only do they serve with God's gifts, but finally, faithful disciples grow up into Christ. Faithful disciples grow up into Christ. Let me sum it all up this way. The ultimate purpose, the ultimate end of Christian discipleship is for all of us to attain the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God, and mature manhood, that is, Christ-likeness. I think the Bible uses mature manhood there, not to disparage women, but to emphasize, to emphasize that we are all becoming like Christ, to emphasize the Christ-likeness of maturity in the Christian life. The ultimate end of Christian discipleship is for all of us to attain unity of the faith, knowledge of the Son of God, and maturity, Christ-likeness. It's exactly what Paul says, isn't it? I, by the way, I didn't, I didn't coin that. I didn't create that definition. That's almost a direct quote of the Bible. Until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to the mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. We are growing up in every way into Christ, the Bible says. But, but listen, we don't want the alternative. We don't want the alternative. There's enough of the alternative in the world in which we live. There's enough petulance in the world in which we live. Notice what the Bible says the alternative is. Do you see? He says, this is so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Now, there are times where the Bible praises childlikeness, so we have to be really careful here. It's not everything about a child that the Bible says would be a negative thing. But when we tell somebody, oh, grow up, we know what we mean, don't we? We don't mean, why don't you lose that beautiful sense of wonder and love and joy? Well, that's not what we mean, is it? What we mean is, stop throwing a tantrum. Stop being naive. Stop being self-centered. I was talking to my children just this week about the, probably the, the biggest growth area I've seen in my own life. And I'm certainly not there yet. I've not arrived there yet. But I told them, I look back so often and cringe at the thought of how selfish I was when I was a child. Even up into my teen years. Just self-centered. And, and not just to the point that I would think, no, this, this would be better, but I'm just going to be selfish anyway. The thought of not being selfish very rarely ever crossed my mind. Which is the thing that mattered most in the world. We know what the Bible means sort of intuitively when it talks about this. And it also talks about a sort of, there's a a connotation here of a sort of spiritual naivety, isn't there? A child in this context can be tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. I can remember those days. I, I can remember the days when the best idea in the world was the last one I heard. Ever been there? It's like my dad reminded me of a million times over, uh, all kind in, in all kinds of clever ways. But one thing he always would remind me of is a is a new broom always sweeps pretty good, Matt. Sometimes we have to stop and pause and consider and weigh. And it's easy as soon as somebody says God for us to jump on it, especially in, in an increasingly secular world. As, some, as soon as somebody says Jesus, we can jump on something. But here the Bible says that's not what we want. We don't want to be carried about by every wind of doctrine. We don't want to be influenced by human cunning. We want to be influenced by God, by Christ alone. That's the alternative. We don't want that. There's a much more beautiful picture here. A much more beautiful picture than that. It's the body of Christ growing up the way that we're supposed to grow up. We learn to speak the truth in love 
It's really hard to do both, isn't it? (laughs) Is it so easy to speak lovey-dovey without truth? And it's so easy to speak truth without love. It is really hard to do both at the same time. Still learning that one. And as we speak the truth in love, we grow up in every way. This is a comprehensive faithfulness. It impacts every part of our lives. So often, I'm afraid we're uh, uh, willing to sell one part of our spiritual lives to grow in another. But we have to grow up in every way. We want to become strong doctrinally, but we can so easily become angry and mean-spirited in our zeal for the truth. Or we want to be so strong in love, but we lose our spine and our backbone and we begin to become anything and everything goes. And in so doing, we lose true love. But we grow up in every way into Him who is the head, into Christ. And then from Jesus, growth is given. This whole body is joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. And then each part is working properly. And Christ then makes the body grow. And all of this is this beautiful panoply of discipleship that then in the end, the Bible says, builds itself up in love. Every part is interworking. Every part is interconnected. Jesus is working through every part. And he's empowering and gifting this part to bless this part. And all of it is being shot through with the love and grace and beauty of Christ. It's being energized by what Jesus is is doing. It is such a beautiful picture that Paul is painting here. Some of you may feel like your walk with Jesus, your calling as a disciple, feels like something that you do alone with God. We've used that phrase so often that perhaps we've maybe even gone too far with it at times, your personal relationship with Jesus. And then sometimes we kind of feel like we're just walking hand in hand alone with Jesus in the park or something like that. Spending our only time with God is when I'm alone with Him. Or that that's the most valuable time we spend with God. You on your own are trying to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. You're trying to be humble. You're trying to grow in Christ. Sure, you come to church to get a sermon to help you out, but then you get, you're back in the trenches alone. And listen, it's important what we do alone with Jesus. Don't get me wrong. Jesus emphasizes that himself, what we do alone with him. But here in this passage, I think Paul kind of gently takes our chins and lifts our gazes upward and outward. In addition to your personal relationship with Jesus, there's more going on out there. You look out, and Paul is showing you the beauty of what Christ has done for you. And you notice at that time, it's not just you and Jesus. There are many others there. When Jesus ascended on high, you are reminded he led a host of captives. And all of us now are in one body. All of us are indwelled by one spirit. All of us share one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. All of us are together in this. And you see that Jesus has gifted everyone. You look across the spectrum and you see the way that what you're lacking, someone else has. And that what you wish you had, someone else can help you grow in and what they are sort of struggling in you struggled with last year and you can help them grow and you realize Jesus is empowering you all to bless one another and to use your gifts for one another and then you notice that all of us seem to be growing up together all of our lives all of our stories all that God is doing it's all intertwined and you begin to notice there's a shape to it all it's a whole body and there at the head of the body at Christ is its head and every Every joint is intricately held together in such a way that if one were to be removed, it wouldn't be as healthy as it were if that joint were there. And Jesus is taking this great host of faithful disciples and he is making this body grow. And the blood that's coursing through that whole body, that's taking the nutrients to each joint, that's coming from Christ the head, that's pulsing through the whole body, is love. And the body builds itself up in love. And it's a beautiful thing to behold because the body is growing. Jesus is growing his people. Jesus is growing us all up in every way into himself. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing to see. Because that body is doing what it's supposed to do. It's doing what it was designed to do. 
It's growing up into Christ. I want to offer an invitation this morning. Perhaps you have never begun this journey of discipleship. You've never responded to Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. I believe with all my heart today, if you'll turn from your sins in repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus, you will be saved. There is nothing standing between you and God but your own sin. And the only way to be away with it and to be received by God, there's a way, but the only way is to abandon that sin and repentance and turn to God in faith through Jesus. You will be saved. If you need someone to talk to, I'll be waiting on you this morning. But listen, you can meet Jesus anywhere. You can meet Him right where you are. Faith always guarantees you access to Him. Second of all, I want to encourage you, if you're a believer, you should have some things to work through. God's doing business in your heart. You need to respond to Him in faith today. Uh, this altar is open for you. I'll be willing to talk to you, or you can do business with the Lord right where you are. Let me encourage you to do so today. And finally, you may be looking for a church home. What a joy it would be for me today to talk to you about what it means to be a member here at First Baptist Church. After this prayer, I want to invite you to come. Let's pray together.